Hi, I'm Stuart and welcome to our podcast, The More You Know. Our podcast will be looking into how the manufacture of semiconductors interacts with our everyday life. Hello everyone and welcome to the last in our first series of The Moor You Know, where we are going to be looking back at the highlights of our first series of the podcast The Moor You Know. Over the last series we have been looking at all aspects of environment and semiconductors and how it affects our everyday life. Um, we've been lucky to have some special guests, but I am really glad to welcome someone that you don't normally see. He's our editor-in-chief. And um, I would like to introduce Matt. Matt, welcome to the Highlight Show. Thank you for having me. It's a highlight for me. Fabulous. And I noticed that for any of you uh, listeners to the show, you may recognise Matt has got something very special behind him. And no, not the Christmas presents. Uh, Yeah, Father Christmas himself. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw the the Christmas podcast last year. He left his, his jacket. Ah, that's um, that's very nice of him. I'm not sure if he left it or he just perhaps had another one. You never know. Probably. So, as I said at the start, Matt, we're going to look at the highlights of this year. Yeah. We've had many special guests, as we said. And um, what's been the highlight for you? Um, I think probably the, the 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 range of guests that we've had on the show over the last almost uh, two years. Um, lots of thought leaders, lots of areas that we've covered and topics. So acronyms, acronyms come to my head a lot. And Dr. Chris Jones, um, we can't, we cannot have a <laughs> highlight without Dr. Chris Jones, who has been really the foundation of the podcast. Yes, yeah. supporting the the expert, an enabler, an enabler. Like. That was the word I was looking yeah. for, an enabler. So for me, acronyms has been a big thing. I think the very first podcast. Could you remember back that that far? Uh, yeah, I mean, you were uh, a little lighter up top. You just have a fresh haircut. I'm sure that people have, yeah, people who have um, seen the last sort of 12 episodes would have seen your hair. I really don't think we need to go on about my hair. Let's talk about the environment and let's talk about the person <laughs> in this tree. Uh, as Matt has realises as the editor, I do interrupt him a lot. In fact, I've spent a lot of time interrupting our guests, um, getting clarity on acronyms. But I think... Um, Dr. Chris Jones, as he didn't like being called, mm. um, did do an awful lot for climate change explanations in COP26. Can you remember, he did give us a bit of a history on both, I think. I think that's probably where we should go into a highlight there. But could you shine a little bit of a light on the 1.5 degrees and why it's so important? So the uh, original mention of one and a half degrees C or less than two degrees C came out of... Uh, one of the cops at Cancun in 2010, I think. Can we just clear something up now? What yes. is COP? Oh, mean? sorry, uh, Conference of Parties. So we've had 26 of them. Maybe that's yes, a story yes. for another day. Yes, we have. The first yeah. one was in Berlin. Uh, and at Berlin... Is that COP1? COP1. Wow. And COP1 decided that we should be looking at global warming effects that take place Where after the year 19, 2000, 1990, I think. Uh, COP3... Oh, I don't want to go through all the COPs, no, no, but no, let's no. get to COP15. I, th- I think it's important to understand that it's been a journey. The challenge with COP is that uh, you can come out with some industrial coalition agreements uh, and some political agreements, but the ultimate declaration has to be agreed by all parties. So it's either all or none. So on that part, I was surprised the COP, 1 to 26, and I do believe Chris talked all the way through every one, I think. Uh, so good editorial skills. Yeah, well, I mean, Chris is a thought leader for uh, for that very reason. You know, he's knowledgeable, he gets his subject matter, and we were lucky enough to um, have him not just on one, but a, quite a number of our podcasts this year. And can I also, actually, this is probably an opportunity to thank all of the team, yourself, who normally sits behind the camera with yeah. a very good production team. But we did start off in a barn. And even although it was a rock star's barn, it was still a barn. And yeah. um, I think now we've got this lovely house we're in with a nice warm fire as it gets a bit chilly just before Christmas. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, thank you for us moving on to such nice, nicer accommodation, a nicer studio. So Chris did talk about a lot of the climate change aspects of it. And we did move on to a lot of issues around um, sustainability and environmental sustainability. Mm. So I think that first episode was really good. We moved on to exploring some initiatives, I think, um, Mm. you know, from science-based target initiatives. 
notice I didn't do that acronym there, which everyone will know as SBTIs. And I think we had some interesting discussions on SBTIs. Uh, decarbonisation of the grid, mm -hmm. um, I think that was an important one and probably one we're still struggling with. I was interested on your thoughts on Neil when we had Neil coming <laughs> in um, from the product company Clevedon who mm. manufactured environmental solutions. What was your highlight with Neil? Well, it's not very often you get to associate sustainable manufacturing um, with the idea of, of Spider-Man. Um, but Neil quite eloquently spoke about how um, with great power comes great responsibility, or I think that's how he meant to go. Yeah, and I think it, for me, I, I know the Spider-Man quote played a big thing, but it was the fact he now has a swimming pool underneath his factory. Um, maybe for not the reasons I was thinking he had a swimming pool, but I think it was that recirculation of the water, showing real mm. examples of that sustainability. You've also got to invest in your people. You've also got to invest in your product, about how you can develop the product and your test processes and the material and your supply chain mm. to be more sustainable. And you just have to look at these things in a holistic sense. And I'd say anyone in my sort of position with, with a little bit of power to make change, you know, I can't say it better than Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, do you know, I think on that final quote, I think, Neil, you've <laughs> captured it in one great statement. So here's to sustainability and here's to Spider-Man. And then we got into carbon capture. This was a, a bit of a sea change for us because I didn't know anything about carbon capture. I don't know how you felt. I didn't know anything. Uh, and now? Uh, I'm wiser. I'm wiser. But what, one thing I would say is, and I know we're, we're going through the episodes here, is that, you know, I was, and I still am kind of the target audience for when we devised this this podcast, you know, um, somebody who isn't necessarily um, in the know when it comes to the environment. Obviously, we have that manufacturing, that that semiconductor view. Um, but we went for, you know, the, the man or the woman uh, walking down the street, um, that broader appeal. So trying to educate everyone. Um, and I think that's kind of where we've gone with things. Um, and we've had a... As, as we'll talk about, you know, the breadth of, of, of guests and topics that we've spoken about. I must admit, I was surprised um, how many people come up to you because when we started on this journey, we thought, you know, people in our business, mm. to be in our company, might listen to it. But I'm always surprised when I meet people and they go, ah, yeah, I listen to your podcast. And you're like, <laughs> really? Like, they, I think it yeah. just really surprises us all. And, it's, I think my sister-in-law is an avid listener now, or she'll definitely listen to the first one because I made her. But, um, <laughs> but I think we do have that coming through. We talked about carbon capture there. So what was your highlight in carbon capture? Was it the fact that you got a bit of uh, insight to the technologies or was it a bit of an insight on how the technologies have still got a bit to go? Or well, was think, it the natural part? The, yeah, I think it's the natural part. You know, Having the guys come in from Belmont Estates, Looking at that 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 bio, that organic, that natural carbon capture that they um, they they employ across their estate was really interesting. Probably not where we thought um, it was going to go when we um, when we thought thought that we'd talk about carbon capture, but a really interesting um, way to look at things. I think his explanation for me, and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I feel like sometimes I'm, I'm, I ask the questions I want to know mm. when he was talking about. Um, um, carbon credits as well and how that ties into your what did he call it the the natural carbon or environmental carbon mm. capture using nature to capture it I think I, as the series went on I felt as if we were learning there wasn't one silver bullet that was going to resolve a challenge on climate crisis things guilt am I using the right terminology one of the things we like to do on the podcast is it bio Carbon capture or nature carbon capture? What's the best terminology? Are they both the same thing? No, so for us, it's, it's definitely nature-based solutions. It, it's broader as a subject than carbon, but mm -hmm. for the purposes of this conversation, focusing in on carbon, what we are interested in and we are uh, delivering on a site uh, that we own is nature-based solutions delivering actually uh, both sequestering carbon, drawing carbon down, atmospheric carbon through perhaps tree growth or, or other mechanisms, and also carbon abatement, which is to stop the release of carbon from a degraded uh, land mass or, or um, a badly managed land, peatland restoration 
or degraded peatland being one of the key examples. Because we're both in the abatement business then, mm-hmm. the, uh, with our abatement in the semiconductor industry and your abatement in nature. Yeah, no, that was a really interesting part. And again, you know, there was a lot of acronyms came out there, but nothing broke the acronyms about, you know, the, the, the infamous... PFCs, CFCs, and PFAS. I know. I, I that one was that was an eye opener on more acronyms I think than we had at any point, and I think it was because we brought in two scientists. Yeah, never, never do that. Isn't that like the unwritten rule of podcasting? Never I think we're going to have to bring that in. Is have one scientist, and definitely no more scientists than just the one. So today's topic is. CFCs, PFCs, PFAS. What's a CFC? CFC is a chlorofluorocarbon. Chlorofluorocarbon. Yeah, so something that contains chlorine, fluorine, and carbon. Simple example would be CCLF3. And CLF3? No, CCLF3. CCLF3, what yep. is that? So one carbon in the centre, and it's attached to a chlorine, and three fluorines. Right, okay, got you. Uh, PFCs, Chris? Uh, similar to what Steve's just said, but replace I thought that, he was talking about CFCs. But replace the chlorine with a fluorine, and you've now got CF4, which is a PFC. So all of the all the positions are covered PFC with a fluorine. Stands, PFC per, stands? Per fluorocarbon. Carbon? Yes, or per, or, or per fluoro compound. But you've got to be a bit careful because in some uh, some jurisdictions, a PFC is very definitely a carbon compound. And then you start listing the compounds, such as NF3 and SF6, separately. PFAS. Um, PFAS, Chris. Polyfluoroalkyl substances or perfluoroalkyl substances. Uh, but it's a very different, this is a very different game because now you're in a, into a family, a, a very large family of compounds. Uh, the, depending on where you're sitting, could be 5,000 compounds or 12,000 compounds, lots and lots of compounds. So it's, it's very much a family of compounds. Yeah, but, you know, it was great to get um, uh, an opinion or sort of a point of view from, 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 from Steve Cole, you know, yeah, his expertise. Yeah, view on how we took, I think we explored the CFC part on how globally, without the use of the internet mm. or that communications we had now, a movement started to resolve the issue we had Mm. on ozone layer. But it was also interesting from Chris's point of view how actually there was consequences around global warming we didn't see at the time um, in combat and CFCs. I think um, also if you want to, the good thing about the podcast as well, I think we were learning through the podcast, but if people do want to know more about that, they can go on to a nice little plug for your website. Edwardsvacuum.com obviously um, is the is the website, but then obviously within that you have um, our uh, our dedicated innovation hub. Um, so you can do deeper dives uh, on a lot of the subjects that we've covered on, mm. on the podcast, uh, carbon capture, for example, being one. It, it, it was, I think it was a real key part where I think Carbon capture, CFCs, PFCs, um, PFAS are all really part of the semiconductor industry and things we're looking to Mm -hmm. try and resolve, but plays into that, goes back to that aspect of giving the likes of me and you and the person in the street the right questions to ask, because I think we could go, especially with an age of um, anti-science in some aspects, is that we need to um, give the people the right questions to ask. It's not so much about getting the right answers, but asking the right questions. Well, yeah, I think, you know, the environment, uh, being green, um, is at the the forefront of of, uh, messaging to, you know, the, the, the wider public. So giving people a more grounded base in, in terms of what they want to talk about um educating them so they can go further and i said you know explore these topics it's funny you said about education because i think i read somewhere that the semiconductor industry is going to go from i think a 600 million dollar industry to a one trillion dollar industry by i think it's 2030 yeah and we're going to need people mm. particularly we're going to need people without grizzly beards and <laughs> getting towards uh, let's say middle age we're going to have to recruit young people mm. and that podcast with uh, Cassandra Melvin with yep. Claire and Francisca I mm. thought was a different angle but it was about your environmental credentials greenwashing 
and getting the right people in. I thought that was um, a real interesting aspect. And also, we had to... Um, I see you look at me thinking, where are you going with this? Yeah. Um, it was the first time I think we actually brought someone into the studio who wasn't actually here. Yes, yeah, we had to broaden our uh, technological horizons, if you want to put it that way. So just being able to bring someone like Cassandra, uh, I think, you know, who's based in Europe, uh, into the podcast um, was um an eye opener you know we're able to now broaden and we've we and are, we, our carbon footprint well that's the most important thing i think that'll be, be something we'll be looking at next year to get more international guests coming in i mean i'll be walking home so uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i could give you a lift oh, thanks. thanks um you not, on nice the yeah, not on the not bike jacket yeah not on the bike not, not this time um so i thought when claire and cassandra and francisca i think were gave us a real clear indication of what we've got to do and mm. and that educational part and what the university students and the graduates expect from companies to do and I think um, it will drive us on further. Mm. I think moving on there. The environment does play an important part because everyone is saying it. How, how can we differentiate the message to attract that digital age? So I think it's all about how, how we word our mission statement, how we look to attract the young people to come into our organisation. So what are the channels that we're using? What channels do this particular demographic use to search for opportunities? There's lots of different platforms out there, but we can pick and choose specific ones that are reaching the people that we want to reach out to. Mm -hmm. We have to think about the wording that we use. So if we think about writing a job advert, for example, different people will respond differently to a differently worded job advert. So if you have a standard job, job advert that goes out, there, um, there's some stats that will show a woman, for example, will only apply for a job if she can tick all, every single one of those boxes. I can do all of those things. Brilliant. I will apply for that job. And the early careers marketplace is the same. So it's about how we word our job adverts to make sure that they are inclusive for, for everybody mm -hmm. so that everybody can, can make that connection and apply. But I also think we need to be doing more about who we are in our brand, our outreach piece mm -hmm. to this younger generation and educate them on who we are and what we do. I think if you're already in the semiconductor industry, people know us and they know our brand and they, they know our place in the market. But the pieces of outreach that I've done personally, and I've done a conversation and a kind of heat map of all of our activity globally in the semi world, and our outreach is the place where we really need to be doing more work. So to be able to get in front of students and the people that we're looking to attract and talk about all the things that you've just mentioned there, Francisca, because they need to understand our green credentials. They need to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and why we stand behind it. Because nine out of 10 of those students will be looking to apply to a company with these green credentials. And then we come to the last pod podcast of the year, really, I thought for me was um, with Eleni. Yeah. I must admit, I was a little bit nervous, but <laughs> um, it was, I think we, that was on clean air. Yeah. And I think it was insightful. And often our podcasts cover topics that, turned out to be quite topical at the time you know mm. when it was carbon capture when we were talking about that or the, the uh, PFAS but with Eleni about clean air and the cities around the world you know there seems to be a pushback about cities trying to clean their air up and um, you know for the health hazard and I can't remember the figures you said about who but could you remember I don't know but I just I just found that with um, with Eleni's podcast it's probably um the one i feel which has the the most broader reach mm -hmm. you know clean air it's something which is essential you mm -hmm. know to for, for all of us um and you know um to have somebody of her stature mm -hmm. um on 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 the show um was was great i think you know it was i said she it was a, a remote one so we had to sort of broaden our horizons that way but she was such a good um, subject matter expert to have on. Bit, you know, we talked about the ultra low um, emission zones and the bad press they're getting. It, it's kind of politicised, but it was nice to hear someone talking just clearly and succinctly why we need them. Yeah. The who figures that she gave were just astounding. We always hear about alcoholism, we always hear about um, HIV and AIDS, but have you got some kind of figures that kind of gives a scale to the challenge around um, air pollution and how it affects us as humans. So I was, I was trying to avoid 
you know, some of the very doom and gloom numbers, but air pollution is the largest environmental risk to public health globally. So that is the largest environmental risk to public health globally. Um, the exposure of people to air pollution, you know, in the workplace, when they're traveling to work, when they're staying in their homes, um, has led to the very famous, you know, WHO number. And by WHO, I mean World Health Organization number, uh, where they're talking about particulate matter and how it has caused an estimated 7 million premature deaths mm. a year. That's frightening figure, isn't it? It was the it was a great presentation I saw, like the okay, I'll admit it was yours. But um <laughs> but that figure really astounded me when I saw it when, you know, I think you gave a statistic, it's three times more than alcohol or unsafe water in the world. And it's really quite alarming that figure. And there was recently, as I mentioned earlier, that that discussion and it became political about people feeling as if there's an attack on cars. But when you put it into, you know, about car use and extending the ultra clean air zones that they want to bring in, but when you hear that statistic, seven million premature deaths, you know, and four and a half million from outdoor air pollution, am I correct? I think that is astounding. That is the size of London every year. But also I think in there, where, uh, she touched on other areas um, I thought was interesting around the philosophical debate of uh, climate deniers. And um, I think that is potentially what we should look for next year is a, a podcast on how do you engage with climate de uh, deniers? What does a climate denier look like? Do they have a look? I don't know, but maybe we might find out. With so many climate deniers not only in the mainstream and you know just on the fringes but actually in the mainstream and often in sometimes government policy how does it overcome that so that's a very interesting question and i won't be answering you know on behalf of the entirety of sci which includes a lot of researchers um but so i will just be answering as as myself as as eleni you know what's very interesting in in this discussion i don't think that there is any problem without a solution. That's just something that uh, maybe, you know, you can call it my motto, my mantra, whatever. So I don't think that there is a problem without a solution. I just think that there are solutions that we are have not explored yet, uh, have not engaged with yet. So even in that instance, you know, even when we're talking about, um, you know, climate change deniers or or what you spoke about, you know, just that denial in general uh, when it comes to science and scientific comments. I still think that depending on who is the denier, depending on who that person is, depending on their background, depending on their core beliefs, there is still a way to engage them. So I think with, um, you know, Eleni, I think... The, the figures from WHO were, were quite startling mm -hmm. on, um, you know, on clean air, I think globally all around. And, um, you know, we seem to be getting a pushback that, you know, a pushback in all quarters that this is not a good thing. It's just, but I think the WHO figures show that it should be. And, and in general with science and climate change, I think the fact this week, I think United Nations said that global temperatures have risen by 2.9 degrees C, I believe. Yeah. And uh, that's a kind of crazy figure because it just shows you we are not cutting our emissions of greenhouse gases. And I think the other figure that came out, if we are looking, there's only a 14% chance now that we will actually be able to hit our 1.5 degrees C threshold, mm. which is a frightening figure. But I think also Eleni gave a good comment on the part about, you know, there's a lot to worry about, but there's a nice part, I think, Eleni, when we're saying about, you know, communicating with each other. And yeah. I think that's the, the key part for me. One more advice for what the individual can do. Talk to your friends about air pollution, about climate change. Normalize this discussion so that you feel less alone and less weird for worrying about these things. We all worry about these things at one level or another, 
And unless all of us, you know, weird people don't come together to join our forces and talk about this and feel okay about how we feel not okay, we will keep feeling not okay for a while. So talk to your friends, link up to people that care about these things, reach out to researchers. We're all pretty chilled people. So don't feel alone. We are all dealing with that. I've got a question for you. Oh, no, I don't think I've ever been asked a question on the podcast. Well, I mean, you know, we are, what, now 13 episodes in. Um, when we came up with the idea for the podcast, you know, how do you think it's gone mm. in general? I think that we've been, we've been, we've been really lucky to have a, a breadth of topics and thought leaders, you know, on a local scale to a national and, and global scale, you could argue. I'm just curious how you, how you feel it's gone. I think it has gone places where I didn't think it would go. Who would have thought we'd be sitting in front of a fire when we started off in a barn? I mean, it's too hot, if anything. I know, it's, 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 and, um, you know it goes along with our topics are pretty hot as yeah. well for the moment. Um, very good. But, no, very good. I, I think it's it's grown. If I'm being, there's a lot of podcasts out there. I think the highlight we didn't mention was being what well, was in the top five of influential podcasts Around, in semiconductor uh, about semiconductors industry. yeah uh, that was in the business insider uh, magazine which was um, was was really good mm. uh, but i think you know even if it's just one person we're talking to and it is that one person in the pub that's going to ask that question mm. you know every campaign needs your first follower and i think <laughs> we before you get a momentum going so and i think we are probably at that we've probably got at that stage of two or three followers and next year I'd really like us to build our momentum here so people could come to us and get decent information and the right information. We don't always have the answers, but maybe we have the questions. Mm. Oh, you're, I, like that. I guess you could say you're that man standing in the field dancing on his own, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we might have to uh, quote that another time. Maybe. Or maybe show the video. Um, so next year, what are we going to talk about next year? Oh, I think there's there's loads of topics we could talk about. Um, well, I think we've spoke about... As long as you're talking about me, of course. Obviously. But I'm, I mean in the topics. Obviously. Um, we mentioned something a bit, you know, a, a broader view on greenwashing. I think uh, something that we could potentially explore around... Um, green hushing. Green hushing. Green, green okay, green, green hushing. hushing. Um, you know, a lot of governments are having to, to roll back on their idea of when they can hit um that that carbon neutral figure you know why is that why is that happening I don't think just governments as companies as well as part of that green hustling isn't it yeah yeah i mean is there anything in particular you hydrogen, want to... i'd like to talk about hydrogen next year it seems to be some people think it's our environmental answer to all our climate change mm -hmm. um, but again i think um looking at that aspect of hydrogen what's the benefits and what are the non-benefits i think uh, skeptics climate skeptics you know i'm not going to that it's a scary subject so maybe it's just going back to something eleni said on you know how do we engage what's the philosophical debate yeah of something else on climate change um because it is a scary subject and it's sometimes just easier to stick in your head in the sand yeah that's true but i think you know trying to end the podcast on more of a, a cheery note you know father christmas uh can put three guests underneath the tree uh, for you to open up and interview next year on the next series. So who would you like? Oh, top three guests. Well, and I'm putting this personal appeal out here now. Um, Vice President Al Gore, if you want to come and sit in the seat that the two big fellas have been in, you're most welcome. I know we have some uh, people out there who do have. When you say two big well. fellas, you mean myself and Chris Jones? Oh, possibly. <laughs> I was thinking more Santa Claus and Chris oh, Jones. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Al Gore would definitely be up there. I think I'd love to get Eleni back. Mm. I think um, there's lots of topics Eleni has that shows great insight. But no. So what about you? Who would you have? Well, I think you've perfectly filled the first two spots. And if we're going to have to have a, a well, not have to, but if we pick a third guest, um, I'd have to just reserve it for Chris Jones. That's very true. What could we do? The podcast. You know, we is, can't have a podcast yeah. um, without Chris Jones. That's very true. So I think on that cheery note of Dr. Chris Jones, I think uh, myself, Matt, the production team, and Dr. Chris Jones, we'd just like to wish you a very Merry Christmas and also thank you for coming on the journey with us and we hope you come back next year for when we start our season two. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas, Matt. Merry Christmas.